want to read this morning from the fourth chapter of the book of Hebrews, and uh, I'm just going to read actually uh, uh, the last uh, the last part, uh, that part that's found in your bulletin as our as our uh, um, as our text. Although I'm going to be looking at the entire chapter, so um, but we'll begin at verse nine. The Bible says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fail or fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. I don't know how far down I went. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, so far we've been looking at the spirit of Christ in everything. At the very beginning of it, we looked at him being superior to, well, we began by talking about who he was uh, and what God said about him and how he spoke to us in the last days by Jesus. And then we talked about how he was uh, greater than the angels, greater than those that are uh, created beings, greater than those that are servants of God to do the will of God throughout the world in whatever manner it is knowing that there is an unseen world that we do not see, knowing that there are angels encamped around those that fear Him, knowing that they are ministering spirits to touch and bless and help those that are heirs of salvation. And then we talked about how that Jesus was greater than Moses, though Moses, through which individual God gave the law and through which individual he helped to lead the children of Israel out of bondage and all the things that occurred with the things that God did through him as he led them through those 40 years. And then as we began to look in this chapter, we find some more things about Jesus and how much greater he is. This morning in Sunday school, we looked at Abraham and we talked a little bit about what caused him to do what he did down in Egypt. And we talked about him being afraid as he went there, afraid that they were going to kill him and take his life for the beauty of his wife and fearful of the famine that was there and that kind of thing. And, and uh, in that we read uh, the little poem that is sung, Fear is a Liar, and where they took that poem and personified fear and made it an individual and said, he's a liar. And fear does often lie to us. But the very first verse in this chapter, let me read what it says. It says, let us therefore fear. 
That's the first verses, first words that's in this chapter. So what's he talking about? Because over and over again, God tells us, fear not. And every time an angel appeared to an individual, he said, fear not. And every time that he talked to us about death or anything that had to do with it, he said we didn't need to fear. So what is it that he means as he says, let us therefore fear? Okay, There is certain things that we are to actually change that thought about and fear. Let me read some words that Jesus said as he was uh, speaking to those that were around him. And he said in verse 4 of chapter 12 in the book of Luke, he says, I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. The Bible over and over again says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It says that it speaks about do you not fear God, the man on the cross, as he was hanging there and speaking to his fellow that both of them were hanging there on either side of Christ as Christ was hanging on the cross for our sins. And the one says, come down on the cross and take us down with you if you're really the Christ. And the other one said, don't you fear God seeing we're in the same situation. And he, then he says to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. But see, it's a different kind of thing when we speak about fear in this manner. The reality is that there are a couple of things that we need to recognize. One thing that he speaks about in the book of Timothy is... He says, fear temptation as much as you fear the sin. To run from it, to flee from it, to get away from it. And as he speaks in this chapter, he says to us that we need to fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. He said, make sure you're ready. Make sure things are right. Make sure the truth is evident in your life. Make sure. And as he begins to speak about these things, he says, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. They heard the gospel message. They heard the reality. They heard the word of God. They heard what God promised. But it says, But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. He said, Make sure you believe what God said. Make sure there's some faith there. That, you know, the Bible says there's given to every man a measure of faith. The opportunity, the reality, the chance to trust and believe and follow Him. And those that did not go in, He's talking about them back in Exodus. He's talking about them that, that came out of Egypt. He's talking about them that didn't believe when they got to the promised land that they could overcome. He's talking about them that didn't trust God in the midst of all of the things that they had seen with the waters parting and the water coming out of the rock and the magnificent things that God did in providing them the manna and the quail and everything that they needed to be able to supply every need and protecting them with the, with the fire uh, in the cloud of a night and and putting it between them and their enemies, and fighting their battles for them, and overcoming their enemies. And yet they did not believe. 
And he says, don't be like them. Take God at His word. Trust what it is He says. And trust in the one that He sent. And he speaks about rest. And those things that I have read to you already. He says, As I have sworn in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. And then as we read down through here, we come to a verse that sometimes is confusing to people because of the manner in which it reads. I don't know what version of the Bible that you happen to have in your hand, but if you read verse 8, it, gets you, it, it kind of makes you wonder just a little bit as you read it because it says, for, Je for if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? And so they look at it, and any time you see the word Jesus, you think it's talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Well, understand the word means Savior. And understand that in Old Testament scriptures, the word Joshua meant Savior. And when you speak His name in Hebrew is Yeshua. And when you read that verse of Scripture, you need to understand what it's talking about. It's talking about, he just talked about Moses, and he just talked about how much greater Jesus is than Moses, because Moses couldn't even go into the promised land because he himself had sinned. And he was only able to look at it because of striking the rock that second time and marring the image of what it meant about Jesus only having to be struck one time, only having to die once for us, only having to give his life one time. And now he's talking about being greater than Joshua who led them into the promised land but was unable to eradicate and get rid of the enemy and to give them rest in that situation. And that's what that verse is about. So it's actually saying in some of the versions you have says Joshua in that situation. I don't know whether or not yours does, but the King James Version says Jesus because that is the Greek word for Joshua in the Hebrew. You know, it's like my brother, whose name is Sylvester. In Spanish, it's Silvano. Okay? You have to figure it out by looking at those. I, mine doesn't change much. I'm, I'm Leonard. I, I don't know what Wayne is, but I'm Leonard in English, but I'm Leonardo in Spanish. You know, I mean, so it, it depends on, on, on the situation. But in looking at that, then we see some of the things it talks about, about rest, okay? Let's consider for a moment. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis, in the very first chapter, as it goes through day after day of creation, as God created the heaven and the earth, as God said, let there be light. As God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly life. As, the, as it speaks about, and let the air, let the heavens above be filled with those, uh, the birds of the air. And then let us make man in our own image. And after our likeness. And then it says on the seventh day, God rested from his labors. Now, does that mean that God said, I'm tired, I'm just going to sit here in a rocker and take it easy for a while? Was God doing anything? Was he involved in any kind of activity? Was there anything going on at all when we talk about that seventh day? <coughs> Well, the Bible makes it plain that he holds the whole universe together. Jesus said at one point in time, he says, the Father works and I works. And what means, 
when you look at the manner in which it is written is that God's always working. The Father is always busy. He's always doing. He's always touching. He's always affecting. He's always holding everything together. Jesus is always working. He is always involved. He is always holding things together. So it doesn't mean that there is nothing going on. It means that he completed what he intended to do and it was good. It means that he accomplished what it was about. He rested in that accomplishment. He rested in what he had done. He had he finished the work that he started out to do. It wasn't it so when we mean rest, we're talking about that. We're talking about completion. We're talking about, and you know, he continued to work because he brought about salvation in giving his very own son to die on the cross for us. And he made it a completed salvation. Full and complete in every sense of the word. Totally Everything that needed to be done was done. That's what we're talking about. And so he had nothing else to do in that direction. He doesn't have to do anything else for your salvation. He's already done it. He already created. He's already done it. He finished it. And so when he tells us about entering into rest, he explains it to us he brings it home to us as he tells us these words. He said, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. He says, Not about you working. And you know, the very next verse, the first thing he says in the verse is, let us labor therefore to enter into the rest. Okay? So it's not talking about, it's recognizing the completion of it. It's recognizing the fullness of it. It is recognizing that we are saved through what this one did. He is greater than all. For God said of him, Thy throne, O God, is established forever. He is greater than the angels, because to which of the angels did he say, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. He is greater than Moses, because Moses was unable to complete it and take them all the way in. But Jesus has completed it and brought us to the place. He is greater than Joshua because Joshua went in and throughout all the time that they fought and done everything, there was still the, the Canaanite in the land. There was still the Ammonite and there were still others that had not been pushed away and pushed out. There was still work to do. He is greater than all because he gives rest. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. You see, when we look at this, the purpose of all of this, speaking about him in every kind of way that it does, is he says, don't be like they were, unbelieving, hardening the heart. Enter in to the rest. And he says, Boy, he's got some good verses in this ver in this chapter. And I don't know that we have time to go through every one of them, but we certainly recognize that one that speaks about the Word of God. Quick, quick means living. 
powerful, energizing, able. Sharper than any two-edged sword. It goes in both directions. And boy, when you preach up here and you preach and it cuts to the heart, those that are out there, it cuts to the heart, those that stand back here. It goes both ways. Dividing what we can't even grasp. See, we sometimes when we're looking in the Word of God, you read this about the soul, you read this about the spirit, and sometimes it's hard to tell what the difference is. But he knows the difference, and the Word of God knows. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It discerns, it knows the Word of God. It, it touches over and over again. It judges, it criticizes, it makes a difference. It helps us to know where we are. It makes the difference. And he says that all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He knows us, he sees us completely. And he knows where we are in our relationship with him. He knows where you are today. And he knows where I am. And he knows whether we have entered into the rest because we believe and trust. Because we have laid it all on the line. Or whether we are fearful and unbelieving and not trusting. He said, don't be like they were. He said, fear lest you be like them. No. But rather fear God. Rather have an awe of Him. Rather have a reverence for Him. Rather trust what He tells you and what He has said. And from that, you know your direction. If you trust God and you trust what Jesus has done and you recognize the greatness of His power and the wonder of His love and the amazing thing that He did for you on the cross, let it be a part of your life. But know that He looks and He sees and He knows everything about you. And you can't hide from God. You need Jesus as your Savior. Have you trusted Him?